Welcome to the Alcohol Minimalist Podcast. I am your host, Molly Watts. If you want to change your drinking habits and create a peaceful relationship with alcohol, you're in the right place. This podcast explores the strategies I used to overcome a lifetime of family alcohol abuse, more than 30 years of anxiety and worry about my own drinking, and what felt like an unbreakable daily drinking habit. Becoming an alcohol minimalist means removing excess alcohol from your life so it doesn't remove you from life. It means being able to take alcohol or leave it without feeling deprived. It means to live peacefully, being able to enjoy a glass of wine without feeling guilty and without needing to finish the bottle. With science on our side, we'll shatter your past patterns and eliminate your excuses. Changing your relationship with alcohol is possible. I'm here to help you do it. Let's start now. Well, hello and welcome or welcome back to the Alcohol Minimalist Podcast. I am your host, Molly Watts, coming to you from an absolutely epic, gorgeous Oregon. It has been absolutely outstanding this week and it is Sunday, February 13th, Super Bowl Sunday. It is spectacular here again. So today I am recording this introduction, but truth be told, I am not giving the episode that I thought I was going to be doing this week. I have told you that this month we are going to be focusing on emotional well-being, emotional maturity, emotional resilience. And I recorded this podcast interview with Dr. George Koob from the National Institute on Alcohol abuse and alcoholism this last week. And I was planning on not distributing it until March after this month long focus. But truth be told, life just happened. And I am not where I want to be with the next episode in terms of this emotional stuff. So I'm going to push that to next week. I'm going to go ahead and share this week, even though it's in February, and even though it's an emotional well being week, you're going to get to hear my conversation with Dr. George Koob. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Koob. He is an internationally recognized expert on alcohol and stress and the neurobiology of alcohol and drug addiction. He is the director of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, where he provides leadership in the national effort to reduce the public health burden associated with alcohol misuse. As NIAAA director, Dr. Koob oversees a broad portfolio of alcohol research, ranging from basic science to epidemiology, diagnostics, prevention, and treatment. I think you are going to love hearing from him. We had a great conversation just about the NIAAA and how we can get, you know, get the word out in terms of correcting all the misinformation that's there around alcohol and also just letting people know that the NIAAA is there as a resource, whether or not you are concerned about whether you have alcohol use disorder or whether you just are were someone like me who wanted to understand the science of alcohol. Uh, the NIAAA is really at the forefront of all the research that's happening on alcohol. And really, he and I agree 100%. The safest amount of alcohol is zero. But if you're going to include alcohol in your life, you want to do it in a minimal way and you want to be making mindful decisions about it. So while we aren't talking about uh, emotional well being in this episode, not so much. Um, I know that he comes from that background. And I think you will really un enjoy this conversation. Next week, I will be back with the episode that is supposed to be coming right now. And that is, is drama driving your drinking? I think you're really going to love it. Stay tuned. And it will be here on Wednesday, February 23rd instead of Wednesday, February 16th. Today, you are hearing from Dr. George Koob. Enjoy the show. Good morning, Dr. Koob. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. I know you are very busy, so I deeply appreciate you sharing your expertise and some of the, the fine research that's going on with the NIAAA. I just gave a brief introduction about who you are and the NIAAA, but thank you again for taking the time to talk with me today. You're most welcome, Molly. It's a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that people don't have a very good, clear understanding of the mission of the NIAA. And when I looked it up, 
one of the things that struck me was understanding the impact of alcohol on human health and well-being. So when we talk about alcohol, and I talk about this a lot on the podcast, because there's a lot of headlines out there that can be kind of contradictory, or they seem contradictory, like we hear it's good for us, it's bad for us. Um, you know, tell me from the, you know, from the from the scientists that you are and from the background of the NIAA, talk to me about what you, the message that you want to deliver around alcohol. Well, alcohol is used by a, a large proportion of our population, somewhere around 70%. And it's used typically as a social lubricant. You know, it's right. used in situations where people want to uh, interact with other people. And it's been used like that for centuries. And, and there's absolutely, on face value, nothing wrong with that. If you stay within the dietary guidelines that are recommended by the US Department of Agriculture, and those mm -hmm. are you know, one drink a day for, for women and two drinks a day for men. Mm -hmm. But when you get beyond that level of drinking, you, alcohol becomes a toxin. Mm -hmm. and Flat out um, you know, causes harm to about 200 different uh, and potentiates 200 different conditions mm -hmm. um, from half of liver disease now, uh, deaths in this country are caused by alcohol. And so, you know, I, I can I can go on about all the things from pancreatitis to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, gastrointestinal bleeds that are caused by excessive drinking. But, you know, I, I think people have to realize that when it's used, you know, within the dietary guidelines, okay. But even there, some people shouldn't be drinking at all. So, you know, women yeah. who are pregnant, women who are thinking about getting pregnant, individuals who maybe have a history in their family of alcohol use disorder, uh, uh, Asian Americans who are, uh, have a, a, you know, the, uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase allele that is right. not very active, which means that when they drink, they get a huge surge in acid aldehyde, which is a carcinogen and also, you know, causes the flush reaction. And that, if they try to drink past that, they, they have a tenfold higher likelihood of esophageal cancer. Alcohol, uh, you know, in, in excess is, a rep, rep, you know, uh, contributes to about 5% of cancer in this country. That's a, right, that's right. a fact that even your local physician probably doesn't know about. And right. you know that we've been working with the National Cancer Institute on that issue. So, you know, I can go on and on, but you know, I think it's safe to say that, you know, if you choose to drink, stay within the dietary guidelines, but otherwise, um, you know, and, and there's really no absolute safe amount of alcohol. I right. mean, for breast cancer in women, you know, even one drink a day conveys epidemiologically, you know, overall a large population conveys, you know, some increased risk for breast cancer. So, right. You know. Yeah, no, I talk about that all the time. I always, I say that very clearly the science shows, or, you know, the recommendations are the safest amount. There is no, it just, as you said, no technically safe amount, the safest amount is zero. So if you want to get really, you know, fundamentally uh, honest about it, that is, but if you are going to drink, you definitely want to stick to those low risk limits folks. They're always in the show notes here. I always have them there. It is, um, you know, and you said one drink a day for women, two drinks a day for men. Those are standard drinks. You, if you don't know what that is, you can also visit the NIAAA's website for some information on what a standard drink actually looks like. Cause I think there's some, there's confusion there too, especially with the way that people, uh, you know, pour drinks in restaurants and, and with our fascination with craft beers, it's a lot, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information that people need to be aware of if they're going to include alcohol in their lives. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, a standard drink is, uh, you know, usually uh, five ounces of wine, 1.5 ounces of, uh, of a distilled liquor and a 40, 40% range, like, like a bourbon or a, or a scotch uh, gin and, and, you know, 12 ounces of beer, but we're not talking about beer that has a, a concentration of 20% alcohol. We're talking about beer around, <laughs> right. you know, 5% alcohol. And, and so, you know, there's that cartoon where they, well, I'm only having one glass of wine the glass of wine is the size of your head, right. you know? So, <laughs> you know, I, all of this information, by the way, that we're discussing for everyone, and I'm assuming you tell people, is in Rethinking Drinking, which is yep. uh, something you can use your search engine and, 
and uh, it'll come up. It's yeah. part of our website. Yeah, so. absolutely. Rethinking drinking is one of the things I wanted to to definitely hit on with you because I really appreciate the rethinking drinking website. I will link that in the show notes, folks, especially the the PDF there, um, because it provides evidence based information. And I really, you know, I really love the focus on science. I talk about science a lot here as well. Um, and one of the things that I like about that so much is because and and tell me your just kind of your thoughts on this, but you know, the sober curious movement. I can't say that I, you know, there's that's great that people are exploring options to not have alcohol in their lives. And I certainly want to encourage, like I said, everyone to either stick to low risk limits or if you are finding it difficult to stick to low risk limits, then alcohol free may be the best choice. What I appreciate so much about rethinking drinking is it's very non judgmental. And it's very much designed to educate people. And so that's one of my concerns with the sober curious movement is because it's kind of coming back to this angle where there's something morally wrong with you if you can't, uh, you know, if you're not handling alcohol appropriately. And one of the things that I appreciate too about the NIAAA is that focus on taking things back from this moral story of alcohol and moving it into a science realm to things that are evidence-based. Tell me more about Rethinking Drinking. And also, I know the NIAAA has launched a new project with these short take videos. Right. Um, well, I, <clears throat> I agree with everything you, you just said. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the advantage from our perspective of sober curious and, and dry October or dry January is is very simply that it allows you to, you know, reevaluate your relationship with alcohol. Yeah. We don't care whether you go absent or don't go absent. We, you know, um, but the fact that you stop for a while and then listen to your body, I think that's the critical issue. Listen to your body. If you feel better when you're not drinking, your body is trying to tell you something. And I think mm -hmm. it's that's an easy way of looking at those those movements. Um, you know, rethinking drinking was to do exactly what you said, provide evidence-based information. And I see that in, in fact, as our mission in IAAA, which is to provide evidence-based information about alcohol-related problems, um, alcohol use disorder, uh, and to help improve diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of alcohol-related problems. And, you know, we are the largest funder of alcohol research in the world. And, yep. and so I consider us a a, a world, a U.S. of course, a resource, and you know, I think, you know, I hopefully our, the information we put out will, will help a, a lot of people. The two other, well, there are multiple other pieces of information we've been getting out. Another one for those individuals who who have a relative or they themselves or or a friend who's maybe suffering from alcohol use disorder, we have the NIAAA Treatment Navigator, and yeah. there you can find out what exactly is an alcohol use disorder. And you can find out what are the range and, and, and spectrum of treatments because alcohol use disorder is a spectrum disorder. You can have a mild, a moderate, or a severe version. The severe version is what we used to call, you know, substance dependence on alcohol or alcohol addiction or, or alcoholic. We don't tend to use the term alcoholic anymore um, to, to try and just remove the negative connotation to some people, you know, not every, and then, you know, I, I, I think uh, the treatment navigator also has a locator in it. I know, not think, and the locator, um, you can type in your zip code and it's a psychology today locator and a substance abuse, mental health services administration locator, and you can find a treatment facility in your area. And maybe it isn't what you but it, by just contacting them, they can refer you to other, to other, uh, uh, you know, treatment facilities. And then the short takes are again, as you mentioned them. Um, that that's just an effort by us to to define terms that people don't really get, and and it's not their fault because they're confusing. Like blackout. Blackout is not losing consciousness. Blackout is simply where you don't remember what mm -hmm. transpired while you're drinking, and at some level, that's pretty serious. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it's like a gap in the tape. Think of it that way, a gap in your memory tape. And so you don't, you know, you mean be dancing on the table with the 
boss's significant other and not know about it and everybody's smirking at you the next day you come into the office and that in fact is a blackout right but you can take it and make it a lot more serious when you think about other kind of interactions so yeah and i think another one of the short takes is on binge drinking and i really appreciated that too because that's something that i share quite often here as well because According to the NIAAA, for women, a binge is considered anything more than three drinks in one day, and for men, anything more than four. And I know there's a lot of people that wouldn't, that don't think that that's a binge, you know, in their own mind. They don't see themselves, they, they go out on a weekend night, they're having four drinks, five drinks. They don't see that as a binge when it is, in fact, by definition, that is what it is. <laughs> Yeah, no, and and we we see drinking way past binges in young people. We call it yeah. extreme um, binge drinking. You know, I mean, uh, and and you know what often happens is individuals start drinking, and and then you start to forget how many drinks you've had, and then the the drinks don't do for you what the first drink did. Right. And that's there's a it's a famous got a name even, but that's the simple version of that is tolerance. And we show tolerance to alcohol within one setting of drinking. And that's something, again, that people don't realize. Very rapidly, your brain and body adapt to any insult. And alcohol, in some level, is an insult. Mm -hmm. Or as I, I used to teach undergraduates at the University of California, San Diego, you know, there's no free ride in the brain when it comes to drugs. So whatever you do when, when you take a psychotropic drug of any kind, when you take a drug that affects brain function, the brain reacts to that right. because it changed the chemistry and the chemistry has to change back in an opposite way. Right. And it's a good way of thinking of it. Yeah. What, what goes, I talk about that a lot here on the, on the podcast, because I'm a very big fan of neuroscience and neurochemistry and understanding that in the brain, especially when it comes to alcohol, because I didn't, you know, I used to tell myself stories about how I needed to drink to relieve stress and anxiety. And the, the truth of the matter is from a neurochemical standpoint, if you drink beyond even, well, any amount, but especially if you're drinking beyond one drink, the counterbalance, what your brain does to try to uh, counterbalance that depressant action is to throw out a lot of neurochemistry and neurotransmitters that are going to spike your feelings of anxiety after the fact as the alcohol is dissipating from your system. So it's not, you know, it isn't true that alcohol helps you relieve stress and anxiety in the long run, especially if you're drinking more than just one drink. So, um, I, I love that conversation and I thank you for bringing up also the SAM at S A M H S A. I can't say it all. So the substance abuse, mental health and services administration in 2014. And that was shortly after you came to the NIAAA, the, you did a study in collaboration with them that showed that nine out of 10 excessive drinkers were not physically dependent on alcohol. And it's my belief that alcohol use disorder is progressive. And you talked about that, about it being a spectrum disorder. And before people develop a physical dependence, they often develop a psychological dependence. But I believe personally that it can be rewired if they become more aware of that and they can actually change their, their belief system around alcohol. As a neuroscientist, someone that has studied the brain as well, do you believe that people can create new neural pathways and rewire their habits around alcohol if they haven't crossed that threshold to physical dependence? Um, the answer is yes. Even if they've crossed the threshold of physical dependence, the answer is yes. With one, uh, one slight change, we don't, we don't grow new neurons in our adult brains, uh, except possibly in the hippocampus. And even that's a bit contrary controversial with, with humans. But what we do is strengthen circuits that maybe weren't uh, you know, activated in, in the past and mm -hmm. utilized. And so my example would be, and this has been shown in, in individuals with, with alcohol use disorder, is that it, if you go abstinent and, and you are go into treatment, whatever it is, it could, it could be you're doing it on your own, and your brain starts to recover, what starts to recover is, is like, uh, you know, driving on, on uh, I-95 on the East Coast is, is the way a person might get from A to B in some cognitive task uh, it, who doesn't have a history of AUD. 
but a person who had even severe AUD still can get from, uh, from A to B on that cognitive task, and, and, but they take the side roads mm -hmm. because the side roads now have been strengthened. It's, it's kind of like what, the, what you do for your, your knee when, when you blow your anterior cruciate and, and, and you have to strengthen the muscles around your knee to, to, to function normally. And so we do that in our brains. And you're, you're absolutely correct. I mean, um, alcohol will, in the rising phase of the blood alcohol curve, it, uh, you know, it will reduce your stress response. But as soon as the alcohol wears off, the stress response in your brain, and there are neurotransmitters that we use for our stress response, come back with a vengeance. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then every time you drink, you're, in a sense, causing the problem that the drinking is supposed to right. be alleviating. Right. And so you get into this vicious cycle that you're trying to fix the problem with uh, with a drug that's making the problem worse, as you pointed out. Yeah. And these transmitters are are they got big names, but but they're you know like corticotropin releasing factor and dynorphin and and norepinephrine. These are transmitters that we need, okay? Because we have to have a stress response. You step out in front of a car in New York City or a taxi, and it's bearing down on you. You either have to freeze and go back to the sidewalk, or you have to run across the street. And when you get across the street after evading being hit by a taxi because you walked um, against the light, you know, your brain is hot. Yeah. <laughs> All kinds of stress. You'll, you'll find your heart's pounding, your face is flushed. You, you suddenly, you know, your brain is wide awake and you can think of great new ideas. Um, but I don't recommend that for getting great new ideas. But anyway, you, you get the picture. Yeah. So we need those systems. But unfortunately, um, alcohol makes those systems chronically active, and, and, and that drives a lot of what, what we used to call alcohol dependence. And you're right, it doesn't have to be physical, it can be emotional. Um, I don't tend to use the word psychological dependence or physical dependence because the brain is physical. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's getting into epistemology. What I, what I really want to emphasize is that that negative emotional states are a major driver for excessive drinking or been a major driver for excessive drinking during the pandemic because all of yeah. us have been stressed in different ways and they're a major driver of relapse for individuals who do have an alcohol use disorder yeah, absolutely. In fact, I've just spent the whole month, I will have spent the whole month of February talking about emotional maturity, emotional resilience, emotional well-being, because just as exact, exactly as you said, the, the vast majority of people who develop alcohol use disorder issues are doing that because they're they of a negative emotional state. And so we need to we need to figure out how to uh <laughs> you know handle our emotions in a better way because alcohol doesn't really help. Alcohol doesn't solve the problems. <laughs> yeah. And one other point, you can get there multiple ways. You can be traumatized as a child. You could, you can live through a pandemic, but you can drink a lot and just drinking a lot drives these same systems. And I think a yeah. lot of people don't understand that piece. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, I'm so glad that you brought up the COVID-19 locked lockdown, because obviously, as we know, um, that has been a, an ongoing issue here um, in not only in the United States, but of course, across the world for the last two years, we've seen such an increase in alcohol use. And um, I just wanted to reiterate what you said in terms of it's not only not effective for reducing stress and anxiety, but it also isn't very good for our immune system either. <laughs> No, I mean, there are four ways that alcohol can interact with the pandemic, and we've already talked about two of them, um, but the other two are, you know, uh, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome is exacerbated by alcohol without uh, a virus that attacks the lungs. And then you have a virus that is producing the same thing when you're in the hospital, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome. And so, you know, we have a number of research grants out there right now trying to find out if there's a, a, a more direct interaction, but it certainly could be an indirect interaction via the uh, immune system. And then of course the disinhibition, which we've talked about indirectly, uh, you know, people doing things um, in crowded rooms with poor ventilation and then taking the masks off because they're drinking yeah. 
and then, you know, getting loud and boisterous and, and you know, that kind of shouting has um, uh, clearly been demonstrated to be uh, contributing to the spread of virus in a, in a crowded environment. So those are the four areas, um, you know, that alcohol interfaces with the pandemic directly. Yeah. Awesome. That yes. And so I'm sure there's I can't there are, as you said, more research out there right now, right, that's ongoing for figuring out these issues with COVID and because uh, I don't think COVID's, we would love to say it's going away soon, but I just think that it's going to be around for a while. So we probably need to figure out how to um, uh, handle that on an ongoing basis. Dr. Kube, I know you have another uh, talking engagement to get to. So I just appreciate you taking the time today. I will share all of these links in the show notes, folks, on where you can get more information on the NIAAA and all of its resources, because at your core, at its core, it really is an educational piece for anyone who is trying to change their relationship with alcohol. And that's really what I what I talk about all the time. We want you to be healthy. We want you to be safe, as safe as possible if you're going to include it. And so, uh, Dr. George Kube, I just appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you, Molly. And if you have any further questions, feel free to send them to our team. And, you know, if you want to ever do this again, I'm happy to answer questions from people. So absolutely. That would be wonderful. I appreciate that. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to the Alcohol Minimalist Podcast. This podcast is dedicated to helping you change your drinking habits and to create a peaceful relationship with alcohol. Use something you learned in today's episode and apply it to your life this week. Transformation is possible. You have the power to change your relationship with alcohol now. For more information, please visit me at www.mollywatts.com.